Hello, everyone, and welcome to another SCJ Marketing Think Tank webinar. Today, we will be talking about a really interesting topic. We're going to talk about social media on a budget, which I'm sure is going to make everyone really happy because uh, everybody's out to uh, work on marketing at a budget. We're going to be talking with Caitlin Rulin, uh, who's going to, who is actually the social producer at Search Engine Journal. She has a couple other things that she does. I'm going to let her kind of introduce herself a little bit. Caitlin, you want to take just a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, as Brent said, I'm Caitlin, uh, and today's webinar is designed to help those with so starter social skills and limited resources get the um, most out of their social media. So to introduce myself a little bit, um, again, my name is Caitlin, and I was born and raised in Florida, received my bachelor's degree in public relations. I worked as a freelance photojournalist for a few years and then moved on into consulting with brands, small businesses, nonprofits, and different grassroots organizations in promotions and social media. Another passion of mine is traveling. I've spent some time volunteering in humanitarian aid projects and several different underdeveloped nations. I'm a partner in an organization called Squalor to Scholar. It's a child sponsorship NGO based in the Delhi, India area. But most recently, I've been working as social producer at SEJ, building and reconstructing our strategies and getting to know some awesome influencers in the digital marketing field in the process. Awesome. But, Oh, yeah, sorry. I want to know a little bit about you guys. So, um, so Brent's going to jump into our first poll now. Yeah. Well, we're going to do the first poll here in a second. I'm going to go ahead and give us a little bit of our, our house rules and stuff like that. Then I'll jump into our first poll, which will kind of set the stage. Caitlin, your uh, slides are not showing. So if you can work with Danielle a little bit while I'm doing all that, we'll make sure we get the, uh, the presentation back up. There it is, but it's the oh. uh, wrong screen. So just use your Skype or whatever or work with <laughs> yeah, Danielle. And figure this out. So look, there's a couple basic house rules, not really rules, but just recommendations. Um, if at any time during the webinar you should happen to have any questions, comments, experiences, anything that you feel like you would be willing to say in public, um, you are welcome to use the webinar question box. There's the question box in the bottom. You type it in there, submit it, and we're going to see it. Um, you're also uh, encouraged to use the hashtag SEJ Think Tank, one word, SEJ Think Tank on Twitter. We will be monitoring that and, and in interacting with you and taking questions there as well. Um, we're going to start off with a poll here in a second, but we're also going to have another one or two polls throughout the presentation. These are just an opportunity for you to participate, give us some feedback, help us kind of you know get a sense for where everybody's at or what everybody's thinking. Um, throughout the presentation, we're going to reference resources, um, you know, tools, little things that we might toss out there that might be useful to you. And we'll do our best to link those resources in the chat and also on Twitter. If by chance we miss something, just let us know, slap us, and we'll make sure we get it out there for you quickly. Uh, after the webinar, we would love it if you can stick around for just a couple minutes. Five minutes or less, we do a quick survey at the end of every webinar. We use this survey to really dictate kind of how we do our webinars in the future. So if you have the, uh, a couple minutes, we really appreciate it. It's very simple and easy. The entire webinar will be recorded. Um, it will be made available through a recap post on Search Engine Journal, um, so you can share it, revisit it, rewatch it, you know, whatever you want to do with it, it will be available for you within a couple days. So without any further ado, let's jump into our first poll. So the way polls work, I'm going to toss them up. You're going to get a chance to um, basically answer the poll. I'm going to give you a minute or two, max, and then uh, I'm going to show the results and then we'll press on. So the first poll question, what describes your field? What best describes your field? Is it a nonprofit, a small business, or an other? Um, again, we'll let some people start getting some votes in. Um, just take a quick second. It's going to help us out a little bit throughout the process. So uh, da, 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 da. give a couple more minutes. Uh, if you're confused on how the polling system works, you just push the button and then push submit, and uh, that enters your answer into this system. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show the results. Um, most people are small business. I don't find that super surprising, um, but I, I think it's interesting that there's 21% nonprofit uh, here today. So that's a pretty uh, large number for me uh, personally. Yes, and uh, let's see. I know we always have a problem with getting our screens back on. Can you guys see my screen? All right, so yeah, no, that's so great to see that um, 
there are so many nonprofits here. Um, I'm really excited to see how many nonprofits came out today. We do um, do a lot for small businesses, um, but SEJ definitely wants to be great educational resources for not only those big firms, those small businesses, but nonprofits as well. And so in this webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about the principles and best practices that you should keep in mind when working in social media with a small budget. Much of the strategies um, that I'll be recommending include that you use tactics of public, public relations, community engagement, and then later I'll be discussing a ton of my favorite tools in the category of a collaboration and scheduling, research and curation, design and measurements. So we see many similarities between small businesses and nonprofits. Low budgets, owner founder is often heavily involved. There's fewer staff and less uh, and thus less staff time um, to allot to projects. Um, so as social media producers, no matter what realm we're in, it's our job to utilize our online presence through two-way communication. Um, we want to establish trust in the community. And when you're working with a, a small budget, engagement is really, really important. And so I have always loved this metaphor of marketing and PR. And I think it provides a great picture of collaborate and take your PR and social media out of the silo. So what social media does is takes this traditional PR and puts it in a new package in a creatively concise way. Um, Two-way communication, as I said, is important. And it's one of the principles of my philosophy behind social media management. So if you don't have the ability to spend large amounts of money on social advertising, establishing yourself as a local trusted advisor is a really great asset. I try to think about it as uh, networking. Nonprofits and small businesses are, like, they, they realize how it's in, important it is to engage and make friends, to go to different networking events. Many of the people I know who run nonprofits and small businesses are some of the best networkers I've ever met. Um, so it's important to um, do that same thing online. Um, you can make friends with your supporters in the real world in an online setting. Reply, engage, make your organization an active member of your online community. Now we're going to move into some basic principles and best practices for social. I want to start off by interesting, uh, introducing the post method by Charlene Lee and Josh Burnoff. It's explained in their book called Groundswell, Winning in a World Transformed by Social Technologies. And the post method focuses on four aspects that help you uh, create strategies and better allocate that budget that you do have for advertising on social. Um, you can use this method to, uh, or this, um, method to conceptualize social before just making a bunch of platforms that you're not quite sure how you should use. Um, so the Groundswell Post method is P for people. You want to assess your customer's social activities. O, objectives, then decide what you want to accomplish. Then move into your strategy. Plan for how your relationships with your customers um, will change over time, especially as you implement new strategies. And then finally, the last point is technology. That's when you decide what social technologies to use, once you have the strategy and the objectives and you know where your audience is. So to go a little bit more in depth on that, we want to focus on the P first, people. Um, and some questions to keep in mind while you're looking into this. You probably already have a rough idea of who your target audience is or who your fans are. Um, but you want to keep this in mind as you're developing your strategy. Who are your readers? What motivates them? A really important question to ask is where do they spend their time online? If your targeted demographic isn't on Instagram, why would you be on Instagram? Then if you are, you're, you might be using some time there that you could be using in a place where they are actually spending their time. You're going to get a lot um, bigger bang for your buck or a bigger bang for your time if you are um, where your audience already is. And then I keep a post-it note on my computer. When I'm writing social posts, I always ask myself three questions. One, what am I trying to get across? Two, what's unique? And then what is in it for my readers? Why should they care about what I'm writing? Why should they care about what I care about? And this is something that you can start thinking about as you figure out who um, your audience is, as you figure out which platforms that they're using and what they're interested in. So then we move, oh, and then I wanted to use this quote. Um, venture capitalist Stuart Elman said that social media and technology are not agents of change. They're just tools. So we, the connected people, are the agents of change. 
as nonprofits or small businesses, we're intending to engage people in causes or products or services that we care about. We want them to care too. Um, engage with them like you would engage with somebody you meet in real life. Remember to show your passion for your organization or your business or your product. Um, show them why you think it's unique and wonderful and why you need their support or you need their um, patronage. And then we move on into objectives. Um, there's no way to measure social media and create those strategies if you don't know what success is to your organization. Um, and it might be totally different than the success that you see on in a different realm of your organization. So you want to figure out what success means to you. And this is something that you can work with your board members on or your other staff people. You definitely, as I said before, you want to keep social out of a silo. You want to intertwine with all of the other goals in your organization. And so how can you measure that success? Um, for some organizations, like for SEJ, for example, um, we are a publisher. So traffic is very, very important to us. And we want to be able to measure success by seeing that we've grown our traffic from social media to our website. So that could be one um, measurement that you could use, one objective. Um, increased donations for a nonprofit is a very important objective. Email leads, if you're trying to build up your email list or your newsletter list volunteer signups. There are so many um, options on how you can measure success. It's really important to get that cemented down before you just jump full throttle into creating a posting strategy. And then we move on to the S of the post method, strategies. So you want to figure out what you aim to do on each channel before you kick them off. Um, for example, don't make a Twitter just to make a Twitter, because once you start that, if you are not ready to jump full in, if you don't know what you're going to post, it's going to become a ghost land, which is not good. Um, you, if you do create these websites, you want to make sure to consistently um, brand across platforms. So if I'm on your Facebook page and you have a logo that is certain colors and, and your, um, your nonprofit or your small business's branding, it's very important to keep on both your Facebook page and your Twitter page. So your bios should be similar. Your images should be similar. Not necessarily the same exact image, but like different or similar topics, similar color schemes. So when somebody goes to your Twitter page, they're not like, I'm not sure if this is the same squalor to scholar. Um, it might be a different one. Let me look around. You shouldn't have any kind of confusion that this is your page and everybody should know it. Um, and that's when um, you can connect your pages, which is a great asset to have. Um, as you can see on your screen, Facebook has done an awesome job of integrating different platforms. And one of the options that they have now is at the top of your um, Facebook business or nonprofit page, there is an option for a um, call to action button. And so this includes stuff like it'll say learn more or book now, but they've recently added one um, specifically for nonprofits that says donate now. And it is, it is just such a valuable thing to have right there at the top of your Facebook page, and you can link directly to your donation page. Or if you are a small business, you can link directly to the next event that you have a sign up for, or your product page, or a special page if you have that going on. You can also do this with newsletters if you're working on building up those email leads. Um, and that's when you start thinking about, once you start establishing these strategies, that's when you can start thinking about, oh, do I want to start a new platform? Do I want to start a blog that I can then share on social media? And finally, we go into the technology side. So once you have your audience set out, your objectives and measurements of success set out, and then those strategies, you can start looking into the technology. So Leverage New Age Media makes this awesome infographic that you guys see on your screen now. They try to keep it updated about every six months, and then they provide it free to the public. Um, so you can use it in educational settings such as this. Um, and it's really easy to just have a, a overhead view on which platforms um, fit best with your target demographic. Um, looking at this, you can see um, how, like the types of users that are on each platform, how they use those platforms, um, and what, where in, as far as like United States or different parts of the world, who uses what platform. Um, and so it's just a great overhead view on where you might want to be if you're unfamiliar with some of the platforms. Something that's really important to note, um, a recent development, is that Twitter has surpassed Google as a source of news. Um, it's what people use to stay informed at this time. So if you work in a political campaign, voters expect that now. And we can see that through, I mean, just these, um, these two tweets by Barack Obama during the 2012 election. 
social media has brought transparency not only to businesses and individuals, but also politicians. Um, the immediacy and reach of social media um, means that news and information can go viral. It can be picked up by news organizations in a matter of minutes. Um, so it's a great asset to have if you are trying to get your information out there. Um, president Obama was the first president to successfully leverage social media for a political campaign. Um, his AMA or Ask Anything on Reddit um, quickly became one of the most popular threads of all time. And part of the campaign strategy was to reach minority groups, young voters, and it provided to, or it proved to be highly effective in both the 2008 and 2012 campaign. And one of the reasons that this was so big was this was not used in that sort of realm before. Um, but we can see in these posts on your screen how simple a post can be and still be really impactful to the people following those, um, those Twitter pages. Um, you don't always have to be serious. Um, in fact, on social media, you don't always want to be serious. You want to post something quick, engaging, that is going to captivate your audience and that they can share easily. So it's hardly surprising to see that most of the presidential candidates um, that are active on Facebook and Twitter this election season, um, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush are actually the first candidates to use Snapchat to announce their um, bid for the presidential nomination. And then according to research from Ipso Mori, more than a third of 18 to 24 year olds today um, indicated that reading something on social media would influence their vote, um, second only to televised debates. So this is yet another reason why presidential candidates, other um, grassroots political organizations, and nonprofits and small businesses are increasing ad spending or just time spent, staff allotment time on social media. So I wanted to go into a poll too now. Awesome. So uh, fun poll for you. I think this is going to be a little harder one for most people to answer, but I think it's going to be interesting. What's your organization's biggest social media challenge? One, engaging new customers, supporters, and generating leads. Number two, understanding how to create a social strategy plan, finding the time to allocate to social media. Now, I know you're asking, where is number four? all of the above, but you're going to have to make the hard choice and pick between these three. So again, what's your biggest challenge in social media? Engaging new customers, generating leads, or is it understanding how to actually create a social strategy, or is it finding the time to allocate at all to social media in general? Um, again, we'll, we'll let people have a couple minutes just to throw their votes in. Um, and then once we get enough in that we can kind of have a good number from it. Um, and I know people are, you know, if you're, if you're one of those people that's sitting out there kind of screaming at the monitor, we don't have Siri yet. Um, so we <laughs> cannot take your voice, vo vo votes, ugh, if I could even speak, uh, audibly yet. Um, I'm actually just burning some time to let you vote. <laughs> um, so about 75% have voted. So we're going to go ahead and close this up and put the results up so you can get a chance to see. And... Engaging new customers, supporters, and generating leads uh, is the biggest challenge that we're seeing here. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. What do you think, Caitlin? Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. It's in a close second with the, um, the, the second response on there as well. And so that, yeah, that's really interesting to see. Awesome. And so I'm... <laughs> I'm actually going to jump in and steal a moment uh, of Caitlin's time just because I know everyone here is very familiar with our webinars, um, but I wanted to introduce you to our amazing Marketing Nerds podcast series. Uh, you know, it's just that amazing that you have to download it now. Now, on a serious note, um, this is something we've been doing for about a year now, and it's uh, we have, you know, a lot of really good episodes with people like Jay Bear. Um, you know, just a ton of really, you know, influential and, and really cutting edge experts in online marketing and across the entire digital space. Um, we, we really go through a lot of effort to kind of identify people, force them to kind of come up with topics that are going to be very beneficial and steer the conversations towards being educational uh, to the audience. So if you haven't checked out our Marketing Nerds podcast, I highly recommend you take a moment. Um, and, and it's one of the places that you can continue to uh, be annoyed by my voice. So uh, check it out if you get a chance. Cheers. Back to you, Caitlin. Yeah. No, and I'm a, a big advocate of the Marketing Nerds podcast, so please go download it if you haven't. Um, but Especially I did your episode, to... right? Yes, you know. <laughs> 
Um, but I did want to go into what should I post about? Because I know creating engagement, gaining leads, um, a lot of it goes into the content that you put out there and creating that engagement. Um, and so what I try to think of, like I was very, very intimidated about making a content calendar for a very long time. And then when I finally like bit the bullet and did it, it made my life so much easier. And so it doesn't have to be this high, lofty, big, project content calendar. Create a simple spreadsheet of the dates for the next three, four, five, six months, and then schedule all your publications across all channels. And so this is, again, where you take your social out of the silo. So go into all the other departments, see what is happening. Email, blog, Facebook, Twitter, newsletters, um, any events that you have going on, um, et cetera. Make sure to schedule those all out, as well as important dates, anniversaries of your nonprofit. Um, if you have um, any kind of um, holidays coming up that would be um, important to your nonprofit. Make sure to put those in there as well. So when you see it all in front of you, you'll be able to say, okay, it'll make your, your mind a little bit more at ease because you can see it all in front of you and then you can come up with content ideas based on what else is going out at that time. What else is going on in your community at that time if you're active in your local community. Um, and some post suggestions that you can do. Celebrate reaching a goal, um, event updates, newsletter highlights. Uh, make sure if you have a blog, share those blog posts. Um, take a quote from the blog post, make it into an image, and then share your blog post. So then you have the visual side as well as information about your company. But while you're sharing these, make sure to abide by the 80-20 rule. And if you don't know what the 80-20 rule is, it's where you put 80% content that is important to your target audience but is not necessarily about your organization or your business. Um, so it's going to be if your audience uh, or if your organization, for example, Squalor Scholar um, is about Northern India and about well, human, especially child welfare in Northern India. So sharing um, news about what's going on with the UN Development Project or, or things like that that are not necessarily like, hey, donate to our fundraising campaign or, hey, this is about out squalor to scholar, but it's still interesting topics. So that would be the 80% rule. Share stuff that's going on with your community. Share stuff that's going on with your industry. But then the 20% is where you bring in um, your asks or your stories or your new fundraising goal, your events, etc. And so that way you don't overwhelm your audience with just bam, 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 all the information about me and no information about anybody else. Because then they start seeing like blinders to your posts. So Ultimately, make it easy. Um, you're short on time, I'm short on time, everybody reading your stuff is short on time. So make your posts engaging and easy to share. It's really easy to hit retweet, and if your posts are engaging enough, people will do that, and that will just get your audience or your information out to an entirely new audience. So a great example of a creative social media campaign came from um, Social Tees Animal Rescue. It's a New York-based animal rescue organization. And so they turned to the dating app Tinder as an inspiration to help match their dogs with potential owners in New York City. So not only did they create um, cute YouTube videos like this um, that they then shared on social media, but they, all, they turned social media itself into the content. Um, and so it's just a very entertaining and easy way to share their information and not feel like you know, it's work to learn about this organization. And it's a really cute video too. I think Danielle is going to put a link in the chat box, so you guys should check it out. Um, this moves to our next point. Don't make it all about you. As we said with that 80-20 rule, um, nonprofits or organizations in general that only talk about their own news are going to get less engagement on their news feed. Um, use that 80-20 rule that I spoke of. Um, I saw James Burnett. He is of the Boston Globe, Miami Herald, um, and now works in public relations. And I saw him at a conference, and he said this quote. Getting reporters to cover your nonprofit means telling compelling stories. And so this isn't just for nonprofits. Anybody who wants to get information out there, um, you're going to be a lot more apt to share other people's information if it's compelling, if it has stories, if it has that real life value into it. Um, so embrace that storytelling. I can't stress that enough. Um, nonprofits, small local businesses have stories. Um, this gives us a huge advantage. Rather than writing like a simple caption for a post or worse, no caption at all, write up a reason why you picked the photo that you did or the graphic that you did or why you're asking for $25 rather than $100. Um, 
and get your leads right. A lead in journalism is the first sentence in a, um, in a new article. And so it's that hook. It's what you're going to, to grab people with. So make sure those are very important. That's what people is kind of, are they going to keep reading or not depends on how you catch them. So the nonprofit Charity Water does a great job of both storytelling as well as making specific asks. So here are two examples. Instagram is on the left of your screen, screen and Twitter is on the right. Um, Charity Water has become one of um, the top social media fundraisers anywhere. And it's not only because they exemplify a variety of positive posts, but they also put specific fundraising goals or asks um, as that's um, and proven to increase donations as well. So people want to put a face to a brand. Don't just talk about what you're raising money for all the time. Make your organization a real entity. Show what you're doing. Show who you're working with. Um, show who your staff and volunteers are, too. Uh, why should we like what these people like? Um, you'll engage donors um, or patrons by showing that people who work for you aren't just employees. They are advocates. They're passionate about your mission. Um, you, can do, you cannot do this without making them real people first. So another thing that's so important to remember, people are reading on mobile devices. Um, this I donate tweet on the, on the left side said that the 2015 charitable giving report shows that mobile giving reached a tipping point last year. Um, so you want to make sure when you're working on your strategy, the S of the post method, that you keep that in mind. Brevity is key in mobile. And this goes back to getting right. The first few words, they're going to make all the difference in long form and microblogging. So hook your audience. Act like they're reading a newspaper on their screen. And then lastly for the section, you cannot do it alone. Um, who in your organization can you get to help? Not necessarily giving your volunteers all access to post on your pages, but have them brainstorm content. If they're your advocates, they probably have great ideas that you might not be thinking of because you're working in it every day. So who is excited about social media in your organization? Get them to brainstorm ideas. Get them to take photos. If they're out on the field, I mean, everybody can snap a photo now. So get them to share photos with you. And then really get them to like, comment, and share. When people see that somebody else besides the organization has shared a post or is liked to post commented on a post, they see that real people also care about you. It's not just the people getting paid to do it or the people who are just totally invested in it. It's good to see outside engagement as well. And so as you, as you do that, that will start building up and kind of um, steamroll into, into more engagement in a, a broader audience. So then our last poll of the day, Brent. So this is going to be an interesting poll because this is a poll that I don't have in the system. So I'm going to read it out to you, and we're going to let everybody think of the right answer, and then we're just going to have to tell them the answer and let them kind of know whether they were right or wrong. Oh, uh, and that's and, fine. Uh, so what percentage of Americans using social media say it influences their buying decisions? 24%, uh, 46%, 64%, or 90%? Um, this is this is interesting because I think that from the studies that I've looked at, um, you know, I don't want to give away anything that might you know make people not pick a right answer. But I think everybody's probably picked their answer by now. This is something that I think people are really surprised at how high it is, um, especially if you start getting into some of the deeper stuff uh, as far as um, you know. Uh, if you start getting the second, third, fourth connection points and stuff like that, and influence that you can't even measure, so uh, let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and uh, tell the answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so hold, on, the answer. hold on, hold on, don't, don't tell yet. She's saying mm -hmm. she, uh, she was able to squeeze it in real quick, so I'm going to launch it real quick and we'll let people oh, vote. Okay, there you awesome. go. That's great. Perfect. So Danielle, the queen of speed, <laughs> has managed to throw it in the system within a second. Yes, Everybody's thank got you. the poll up. And uh, you can throw in your number, and don't worry, nobody else can see your answer. So yeah. I want to see how many people are answer. right, though. <laughs> uh, I'm curious as well, so you'll we'll have to give the answer here in a second. So a couple more seconds, um, and then we'll try to get this uh, closed out and up. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and toss it up. And most people said 64%. Um, nice. Uh, the second being 90%, so definitely on the higher side. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, What's the answer there, Caitlin? Well, good job, guys. 64% is the correct answer. And so according to Jay Bear, 64% um, of Americans using social networks say at least one influenced their buying decisions. 
47% of those people say that Facebook has the greatest impact on purchasing behavior. And so this is something really important to keep in mind, um, especially as a small business or somebody trying to get those donations in. I'm seeing it from a monetary value. So I saw John Hayden speak at the Social Media for Nonprofits conference in Boston last year, and he developed this great chart on um, the Facebook ladder of engagement. It came from a book um, by Beth Cantor and Katie Payne called Measuring the Network Nonprofit. Um, so they talk about this ladder of engagement as a way to visualize how nonprofits move in stages from awareness to action. So John Hayden made it into a nice chart and put it on his blog. And so the two things that you really want to look at on this chart are the, the line that's going up the side, the trust and affinity line. So as people become more aware of your organization, um, something closed on mine. So as people become more and more aware of your organization um, and interact with you on different levels, um, their trust and affinity will increase, or they may decrease if you're not um, trustworthy or likable. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as you go up this, um, this ladder. And then you look at the bottom audience size. So this is very, very similar to the sales funnel model that you see um, in the for-profit world. Um, audience size becomes smaller at each stage of the game. However, that trust and affinity becomes a lot more intense. So once people start engaging and regularly attending your pages, yes, it's going to be a smaller portion of people, but those people are going to be a lot more active in your organization or your small business. So this is something to keep in mind as you're making those posts, as you figure out, after you've figured out your target audience, um, looking at this when you're writing posts, when you're figuring out who, who exactly am I targeting in this post or this type of post or on this platform. You can look at this ladder of engagement, this funnel, and see exactly where your people are um, landing at that time and what you need to do to get them higher in the funnel um, and build up that trust and affinity. Now we are going to look into some tools. I know everybody gets really excited about this, and these are some of the ones that have made my life so much easier. First, I want to focus on collaboration and scheduling. Um, remember how I said earlier you shouldn't do this alone? Slack is the perfect place to get everyone together to share ideas, photos, announcements. Um, this is great for if you have somebody that you don't necessarily want to give control of your platforms to, but you do want them to share those ideas, those pictures that they're taking, or if they see something like a, an article or something that may be relevant to your organization, they can just throw it into Slack. You can set up topic boards, and anybody on your team can write a quick note in this chat-like session or setting, and it saves there, which is awesome to be able to go back and look back and kind of keep all of your posts ideas in your photos and your um, brainstorming in one clear setting. Second is Buffer. Um, there's no way I would be able to keep things organized um, without Buffer. You can set schedules, queue posts, check analytics, and more. Um, their paid version is great because it offers teams the ability to queue posts for approval. So if you do have an assistant or a coworker that you want to give access to but you want to be able to approve all the posts that go out, they can type up a post just like they were going to publish it and it will go into a moderation queue. Then you can edit it and put it onto like your timeline on when you want the next post to go out. So Buffer also has integrated with a ton of other social media apps. So you can do things like queue to your Buffer from in pl platform on Facebook and Twitter. That's what you can see on your screen right now. Um, and then as of a few months ago, Buffer also decided to start automatically queuing posts from links for Twitter, um, which is great. Um, as I've mentioned, it's so important to include images, especially on Twitter, because Twitter is just moving so fast that if you don't have an image, if you don't have something that pops to grab somebody's attention, they may miss your post. So the fact that on Buffer they will automatically pull posts from the links that you, or pull images from the links that you post um, is just a great asset and a time-saving asset to have. This was a godsend for me. Then I want to move into curation and research. Um, this helps you abide by the 80-20 rule, push that issue-centric content that you have out there. Um, BuzzSumo um, helps you research trending topics. You can go in, type um, whatever information, for example, um, that India, for example, with my nonprofit. I can go in and type information about Delhi, India. It will bring up trending topics, tell you where it's shared most on social media, and show you what's important to the social audiences that are already out there. 
Another great tool is Twitter lists, and it's free. Um, on your screen is an example of just my personal Twitter lists, and it helps me because I follow so many people, and I do want to catch a lot of the tweets that may be happening when I'm not on my phone or at my computer. So setting up Twitter lists is just a really easy way to keep up with people. Um, so for example, I have um, communication and internet um, Twitter list. So I can go in there, and everything in that list will be just about this one topic, or sort of one topic, all the people who post in there work in the SEO field or have something to do with Search Engine Journal or just work in communications PR on the internet in general. Um, same thing with nonprofit news. And you can set these up for anything. Um, however, do remember that the names of um, both public and private lists. So you can set a list that nobody else can see. But if you add somebody to that list, they will be notified with the title of that list. So be careful how you name your private lists. Um, if you are trying to uh, keep up with maybe VIP donors and um, you want to make a list for that, don't name it like high money potential donors because they'll see that and not the best, um, not the best method to use. So I always like to, to let people rem remember that. And then TweetDeck, um, another awesome free tool that you can use. Um, this is an example of just my personal one. Um, I have notifications for myself for different um, hashtags. And the obvious main function of TweetDeck is to set up streams. So you set them up via these columns. And then it gives you a pleasant, organized way to favorite, retweet, reply, monitor timelines. You can also set alerts for VIP updates. If you have certain people that you want to make sure you don't miss their updates, um, you can set alerts and they will ping you when an update happens. Um, and it just and it also allows the ability to schedule tweets. So if you're not using Buffer or another scheduling tool, you can do that here too. And then moving on into design, get visual. Um, photos, images are easy to post, and everybody has the ability to um, either quickly snap a photo or quickly create an image. Um, and use these to tell that story. The first uh, tool that I want to mention is Canva. A lot of you guys have probably heard of Canva. It's free. Um, it has great um, layouts that are already on there with some extra um, paid options. Sometimes you can upgrade a font for a dollar or put an extra image or use a different background. Um, but there are so many free options on Canva. And you can do everything from a square um, Instagram graphic to a Facebook cover photo to a presentation. Um, there are so many options on Canva and for the most part it's free to use. Another similar option is PicMonkey. I've been using PicMonkey for years uh, just because of um, the ease of it. I have Photoshop on my computer, different editing softwares, but sometimes if you just want to do a quick overlay, an arrow, a box around something, or a text overlay, PicMonkey is the easiest way to go. Um, there, are, there are pro features or their Royale features that you can pay for, but there are so many different graphics, overlays that you can use for free. And then there are so many free image sites out there. So if you work in an organization that doesn't have quite as much access to taking photos of patrons or products or getting those engaging photos out there, stock photos um, can be really awesome. I mean, obviously, um, use ones that are very applicable to your organization, but there are so many free image sites out there. Um, Stock Snap, Morgue File, Pixbay, I've used all of these, and some of them require attribution, but otherwise some of them don't even require that at all. Make sure to read the guidelines before you use them. But um, Mindy Weinstein actually wrote an awesome article for Search Engine Journal not too long ago that had 25 places, so much more than these three where you can get free photos. Um, so I think Danielle's going to post the link to that in the chat box as well. And it's just a great asset to have. I didn't know about some of these that she had posted, and I've used this as reference quite a few times in my day-to-day -day work. And then measurement. I mean, measure, measure, measure. That's how we know if we're hitting those objectives, if we're doing well in our job on social media. And we don't want to just, as I said, do it to do it. So make sure to track and see that the posts that you're putting out are actually doing the work that they're meant to do. Um, insights on Facebook is a great asset. It's free. It's right there. If you have a page set up, you can go up into the toolbar and insights is there provided to everybody. And so you can see you can go into more specific things on the left toolbar, likes, reach, page views, if you want to get that um, more in-depth scope. But you can see a general overview. You can see um, 
who is seeing your page, where your posts are going, if it's gone down or up, um, how your page likes are working. And it's just a fun thing to go in and look around, kind of grasp where everything is, so that way you can start tracking um, your, your analytics on Facebook. Twitter also does the same thing in, in a similar manner. If you go to analytics.twitter.com, it pulls it up for whatever account that you're signed into. Again, this is provided free to everybody. And you can see summaries as well as go a little bit more in depth on tweets, audiences, um, events, different stuff that you're posting. Both of these um, provide um, the option to learn more about your current followers. So even though you have something in your head about, okay, I'm targeting this sort of person, um, you want to make sure to go in and check this and make sure that the people visiting your page are actually the people that you think are visiting your page. Um, and sometimes you might need to change around your strategy so you can start aiming a little bit more at your targeted audience, or you might be surprised and have an entirely new audience that is interested in your nonprofit or small business that you had no idea about. Um, and so it's a good thing to, to keep in mind on who is actually interacting with your content. Is it the people that you think or is it not? And so you can see both of these information through insights and Twitter analytics. And I just saw on the slide it's switched. So if you go to um, Twitter analytics, you'll see the top image and insights for the bottom image. Now, Crowd Booster is where we get all of our high-level looks at social here at SEJ. And I, I use this for nonprofits and different um, people that I work with on the side. It, you can gather um, hashtag reports from here. You can tr track best performing posts on Twitter and Facebook. Um, their charting function gives you a great look at growth in an easy to comprehend way. Um, it shows um, the, the scale of pictures, post performance, and so what you want to see when you're looking at all of these metrics is you don't want to, uh, you want to avoid vanity metrics, which is like followers and fans. Um, it's not hard to tell when people buy fans. And so what you really want to focus on is the, the reach of your post, the engagement, how that engagement and your posts are working back to those measures of success that you set up at the beginning. So ultimately, have fun with social media. One of the reasons I love working in social media is because it's so fast-paced, but at the same time, it's so lighthearted. You don't have to be serious all the time. Like, keep in mind when and how you use your own personal social media. You use it often to decompress, and so is your audience. Um, use that to your advantage. Um, and then ultimately, see what works. As you're measuring things and trying new things out, See what works and then do more of that. Um, that is the tried and true way. Um, you will see as you go, go through your strategies and start posting on your platforms what works and what doesn't work. Don't keep doing something if it's not working. And if it's not broke, don't fix it um, as far as something else. Um, keep trying new strategies and tactics, but the ones that work are the ones that work. So I'll leave you with this quote from Chris Kearns. He is the VP of Research and Insights at SpreadFast. And think about social as a support to what you, we already have. Social can move the needle on the goals you already have established for your company. And again, this goes back to do not keep your social media in a silo. It cannot run by itself. It cannot reach those goals if you are just trying to do social media to do social media. Um, remember to have a reason for it. Work with um, the other realms of your organization. Don't just do it to have it. So if you want more um, resources, please, as we mentioned earlier, Marketing Nerds, um, I love. I listen to it every week. Um, and so check out these Marketing Nerds podcasts. One was recorded about a year ago um, with Daniel, and we chatted on a similar topic, social media tips for nonprofits. Um, use some extra tools, some other um, advice in that if you want some additional resources. And then the second one is an episode I hosted, and Brent was actually the guest of the week. Um, he provided some great insights on influencer networking, as well as shared some awesome tools that range across a variety of platforms. So if you don't feel like any of these tools have necessarily fit exactly what you need, um, check out this podcast, and Brent has just an amazing ideas. so check that out. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, email, Caitlin at searchenginejournal.com. But thank you so much. Um, Brent, back to you.
Awesome job, Caitlin. A lot of really, really good information in there. I like the way we were able to go through concepts, go through strategies, go through like ways of thinking about what you're doing in general, and then kind of you know finishing off with some of the tools um, and really kind of keeping it all kind of on that kind of budget like mindset. I know that was the goal of the presentation, but sometimes those get off and and it doesn't happen as well. And so I think it really did uh, provide a lot of information there. Um, one thing, if uh, we can just jump. To the uh, to the last slide, one more, I think there's one more slide. If you, um, you know, we're going to jump in. We have a little bit of time. We're going to jump into some Q and A. I, I did want to mention just a couple things real quick. One, um, the next uh, webinar that we're going to be doing is on April 20th, same time, uh, same day, same bat channel. Um, it's going to be about improving search discovery discoverability uh, with influencers and offsite content. It's going to be with Krista La Riviera. La Riviere, I'm going to say that right. Um, uh, she's going to be talking to us about this topic. I think it's going to be really interesting, so definitely mark your calendars, register if you get a chance. I think the link's in the in the box already, so uh, definitely check that out. And um, again, you know, once we finish the Q and A, uh, we're going to have a quick survey. Love you to stick around a little bit and uh, make sure you uh, you know follow uh, Caitlin on her social channels and ask her if she has any questions. Um, we're going to jump into a couple questions. I, ha I have a number of them that have kind of started to roll in, so. Um, give me a chance to kind of look at this. This is a, a broad question, but I think it's one that a lot of people in, in the small business or in the, the nonprofit space kind of deal with. Um, and that's the sense of, okay, what if I'm just starting out and I don't even have any readers yet? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a broad topic and we could go on forever about what, what should be your first, you know, two days in social. But looking at kind of like what should be your first day, uh, two days in social, what would you really recommend people to start getting, you know, started and getting some exposure? Uh, you know? As far as getting some exposure, if you've already done the whole, you know who your target audience is, you know what your strategies are, um, and you have created that content calendar. So that is the first thing that you should do. Make sure that you know what you're going to post when you post it. Have a queue set up so it is going out on a regular basis. Because you don't want to just have maybe one post every other week because then people aren't going to like those pages um, because there's no reason to. Um, but then once you actually create the site and get involved in them, make sure to talk about it everywhere. So if you have an email newsletter that goes out, include links to those on that. Make sure it is above the fold on your website. So that means as soon as you go on your website, it is right up there, all your social icons on the top of the page. If you do have some money to allocate towards a budget, this is a great time to type in all your um, your people, your audience um, segmentations, and do a small budget run for a post that you're promoting um, to start bringing people into that. On Twitter, um, go through and like a bunch of people who are interested in your post. Start engaging on, um, on Twitter, on Facebook. Go to different groups. Comment as your page um, in, in a relevant way. Don't just obviously spam people. But go in and start engaging. And once people start seeing your name, they will add it. Um, but then again, make sure to tell the people who already support you in real life that you're on social media now. Yeah, and one other thing that I think is really, really important uh, for, for companies that are just starting out is that social media is very, very, um, it's very fast and it, it can really be intimidating. And I think um, we all have a certain um, element of marketing that we resonate well with. For instance, you might actually already be on Facebook because you have friends and family there where you might not be on Pinterest or you might not be on Google Plus or any of these other channels out there. I, I like people to start where they know because you understand the features, you understand the rules, and it's much less like work to open up the system and participate. So if you know email, if you know uh, social, if you know certain channels, focus on where you're already comfortable. Establish those and then build from there. Um, and, I, and I agree with your, your point on some of the vanity angle. I mean, really reaching out to people and getting involved in the community a little bit can help a lot for getting your initial followers and your initial yeah. supporters. And when it comes to people who are already like you, you have to ask. People, I mean, for the most part, aren't going to go out of their way to find you. But if you ask um, over and over again, it's like, oh, okay. Like, I mean, don't beg them. But say, hey, did you guys realize that we have a Facebook page? Hey, did you realize that we have built up a Twitter following? Um, and starting to do that. But, I mean, I think the points that you said, Brent, are, are very important. Um, and, and engagement is very important as well. So one question here, it's kind of specific, but I think it does fit in with the, the idea of events and nonprofits and stuff. How do you, what are some of the tips that you would have for people that are live tweeting or covering social media events? 
Um, I think, I mean, as far as if you're live tweeting on Twitter, um, live tweet as much as you can. Um, it not only does, like, it just help you practice in the best ways to write tweets, um, especially if you're new to these websites. Like Brent said, use the ones that you're familiar with, but you, if you're unfamiliar with a website, especially something like Twitter, if you're at an event, um, it's a great way to sit on your personal one, practice, and if it's relevant to you, your nonprofit or your business, practice on there as well. Um, I mean, practicing sounds kind of scary for a, um, a big Twitter for your organization, but it doesn't have to be. Like sitting at something, like people are reading your site to get that, that 80%, um, like I said. So sitting at somebody else's event and live tweeting it is a great way to create that engagement and show that you're interested in stuff besides your own nonprofit. Does that answer your question, Brent? Oh, it was, it was not my question, but I think it answers oh, the oh, question. Yeah. Yeah, that question. Okay. <laughs> the question you read. Um, no, I, I think that's good. One of the other things I really like to do, and I think that a lot of the people even on our team do this as well, is we don't just walk into an event blind. You know, as much oh, as yeah. you don't know exactly what's going to be said in this presentation, you knew it was going to be about small business, you knew it was going to be about nonprofit and about social media, you knew who the speaker was, you can kind of recap a little bit of the stuff they've written recently, some of the work they're doing. You can come up with hashtags ahead of time you can come up with quotes that you can you know use you can come up with information that can benefit you and you can make yourself really shine in representing the information that's being uh, presented by just planning a little bit in advance. Yeah, I mean, and especially if you're going to a conference or something where you do have the agenda beforehand and the titles of the uh, session topics and stuff, um, you can, yeah, you can plan a lot ahead of time. Um, I see that all the time in live tweeting. You might have, yes, you're going to be tweeting in the moment, you'll be retweeting, you'll be doing stuff like that live time, but you can live tweet where you've planned it before. Um, we have done that for events where it's like, okay, I have an introductory thing. I have made up an image on Canva from the topic of the presentation or something that I know will at least be kind of touched on. And so that's something that I can put out there and then also build it up with the, the actual live tweeting. I, I do want to add one more thing because I really want people to, to walk away from this one thing with some really, you know, a really specific point. Just like anything in content creation, be the one that everybody wants to share. If I'm going to go quote a speaker, but I see somebody has already quoted them and they've got a picture and they've got the right hashtags, I'm much more likely to just retweet somebody or reshare somebody's content if they've summarized what I want to get across. So taking a couple extra minutes to really do good social updates during events can get you a lot more visibility by people sharing it and participating with it because it becomes the standard for what people want to say. They almost feel like, why am I going to rewrite this exact thing? It's written so eloquently. It's already in 140 characters. I'll just roll with it. So yes, that's another yeah. thing to consider. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We, we don't have a ton of time, but we do have time for a couple more, so I want to get in here. Um, should Okay, this is, in, this is a good one. Should we let volunteers do our social media? Or do, should we allocate it to somebody that's hired and, and assigned to it? I think that really depends on your organization, especially with like security features and stuff like that. Um, but if it's just a general volunteer who's been with you for a long time, you trust them, that is the main thing. Make sure you trust somebody before you give them control of your social networks. So if you have a volunteer who's been volunteering for you know years and they're really invested and they're pretty much an unpaid employee, Sure, I, I don't think that there's a problem with that at all. Um, but again, make sure that that trust is there. And that's why tools like Buffer, where you have the moderation queue, or even um, like free tools like uh, Slack, where they can, you can say, hey, um, you know, I don't necessarily, like we don't give volunteers access to the back end of our social platforms, but we would love for you to write posts for us. Just the way we do it is, you know, write a post, put it into Slack, and then we will post it on the site if it fits our, you know, our contribution um, requirements. And so that way you can have those people writing the posts for you and not necessarily have to give them back-end access. Or, like I said, if you have those people that you do trust, I don't see a problem with having a bunch of people working on it as long as you have some kind of posting strategy and they are, like, understanding of that and not just posting all willy-nilly because if you have five people in control of your social network and they all decide to post in the same day, then you may not have any for the next five days. So it's good to make sure that you have a schedule and that everybody involved in social media is following that schedule or that strategy. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it takes the question of whether they're volunteer or not at that point because if you don't have a strategy, even your CEO can really 
you know, I've seen examples of, you know, the highest level of people involved in country uh, companies causing some of the biggest problems by simply yeah. not having a strategy to follow. So uh, it really comes down to that planning for sure. Uh, yeah. One more question. We have time for one more. Uh, you know, don't worry, everyone. You know, we will get these uh, answers, uh, these questions answered. You can continue to a ask them on Twitter with the SEJ Think Tank uh, hashtag. We'll continue to to get to your questions, and we'll make sure they get into the blog post or get you know answers back to you afterwards as well. Um, what's your opinion? And and this is one that's close to me and you recently. Uh, what's your opinion on social media contests to increase engagement with the use of gift cards? And product giveaways. I made it easier for you by yeah. by finishing the sentence because that that's an open-ended bag without the the caveat. So, yeah. what's your opinion on social media contests when it comes to increasing engagement with using gift cards and product giveaways? I think that you have to be careful with contests. Um, Brent and I, like as Brent mentioned, this is close to us because we've done um, some contests with uh, SEJ recently. And with social media contests across the board, they became very, very popular um, a handful of years ago. And so everybody was doing them. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you guys saw them on social as well. And so if you have a built out strategy and you already have a followership, I think that is important. Make sure that you already have a followership and make sure that you have a strategy for the whole contest because otherwise it can easily fall flat. Often um, some of the engagement might not be as high as you think just because it was so popular quite a few years ago. Um, so people kind of have blinders to them now. Um, I wouldn't do it all the time, but if you have, um, say, an event coming up and you can use it in um, tie with your event, like, oh, yeah, I have a $25 Amazon gift card, um, and you can tie it into some other goal, I think that's important. Don't just do a contest to, to do a contest, but if you can tie it into other goals, it's worth a try. Um, you might as well try it the first time if you already have built up that followership, um, but, you know, it can be hit or miss on either side of it. Yeah, and one thing I, I, I would kind of emphasize is that, you know, because we worked on a contest, me and Caitlin here recently, and, um, you know, honestly, it, you know, it was it was tough, you know, and we were looking at some of the numbers and we were looking at some of the concepts and just thinking it out. Um, one of the things that I think I've learned over the years is that people care a lot less about getting a $20 gift card th these days than they do about being uh, feeling like their social interaction has purpose. And I think, you know, anybody who's in a nonprofit can appreciate that. Um, it's really about emotionally connecting with people these days than it is about giving them some small piece of monetary. I will not join a contest in any way, shape, or form for 20 bucks. But if you do an autism awareness campaign, I've checked in 15 times at my gym because every other one gives a small amount of money. Um, you know, I, people are much more likely to be involved if there's a story that, that motivates them to be involved. So spend a little more time thinking about the story and how your contest can provide an emotional engagement uh, with people. And yeah, and that does go back like storytelling, as I said throughout, for, throughout my presentation, that is the, the biggest bang for your buck as a small business, especially if you're working in local or as a nonprofit, because you have those people there, you have the stories to tell. I mean, big brands pay thousands of dollars to get like good brand stories and that character behind their brand. You guys, for the most part, already have it. And so take advantage of that and, and use that whether you're using it in a contest or just a, across your fundraising or general posts. Remember that you guys have a story and that you're doing this for a reason, you know? Awesome. Thanks again, Caitlin, for, for sharing with us today and spending the time. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, you know, again, we're going to have a quick survey. If you can take a couple minutes, uh, make sure, you know, you continue to follow social with SEJ Think Tank if you have more questions or want to, you know, discuss further. But uh, I really appreciate your time, Caitlin, and for everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Cheers.